Well, I'm afraid people saw the, uh, the word for the day, the B word, and today is be generous. And I wondered how many people would see that and just assume it's about money and just turn around and walk out. And uh, we had ushers looking out for them at the doors to uh, prevent that from, no, I'm just kidding. So those of you online, you don't know us well enough for me to pop off like that. So we're just kidding. But the clinic, there would not be a clinic were it not for generosity. Yes, money, but time, people that are generous with resources of maybe their, their own talents. There, there would not be prison ministry. We wouldn't be at Joseph Harp with the guys were it not for generosity. We wouldn't be involved in the local schools if it were not for generosity. There'd be no nursery ministry, children's ministry, student ministry, college ministry, young adult ministry, Sunday school, small groups, no celebrate recovery, no care series without generosity at every level, all kinds of generosity. Money can't buy all this. It can help us get things going, but until there's a generosity in spirit, generosity in heart, and we'll talk about this, not much is going to happen. I've been told that if you ask someone on the street, and I've done that at times, um, or if someone's asked me what I do, and I mention what I do, and uh, people have never been here, they said, wow, we don't know much about that church, but we've heard you have amazing worship, and we've heard you have, you're incredibly generous as a church. Those are the two things they've heard, seem to be the, the comment I get the most. And so I'm thankful that the city thinks that about us, and it's because we truly want to be generous to this community. We don't do it to be noticed. We don't do it for applause, but we do it because we believe God has called us to it. If you look at the top of your note page, Proverbs 11, verse 24 and 25, uh, I've put the verse there on your note page, and it's from the paraphrase called The Message, and it says this, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. There's a great story back in the book of First Kings, back in the Old Testament. A lot of you have heard it, and I want to just read it quickly because it really is a picture of generosity, of the kind of generosity that comes when we live by faith. You're going to see some faith here when we're willing to be a voice of hope and when we're willing to be known by love. So it's a great story back in 1 Kings chapter 17. And Elijah has gone to a village and he arrives there and, and he sees a widow gathering sticks and he asks her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, and bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And I have only a handful of flour left in the jar, a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. And I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal. And then my son and I will die. There was a severe drought, which meant a severe famine in the country. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do what just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says, there will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. Now, can you just imagine this lady when he said, now do this, go, go prepare a little bread for me first. <laughs> and you just want to have been standing there to see the look on her face. Excuse me, sir? Typical man, you know. <laughs> what, what did I just hear you say? But God had kind of tapped her on the shoulder a bit in advance that something like this might happen. You never know when, but it was happening. And he said, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. There will be plenty of flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers. 
just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. It's a great story. And, and really what we see happening in this story is three things kind of happen here. This isn't on your note page. You can write it down if you'd like. But there, there's really three things happening right here in 1 Kings 17. By the way, that took place probably 2,500 years ago. I can guarantee it. she never dreamed that that simple act of baking some bread with the last flour she had would be talked about for 2,500 years and on until Jesus comes back. You just never know what God's gonna do. So she simply just gave all she had. It was a life and death matter for her. That's all she had left. And I can assure you, I have never ever lived one day in my life having nothing. I grew up in a minister's home. We, by no means were we well off. But I, I've never gone to bed at night wondering if we're gonna have enough food tomorrow. I've never gone to bed worried about the next month or six months or a year, never. Most of us in the room probably haven't either. But she gave all she had at a moment of life and death and then God used what she had. Don't you ever underestimate, as we talk about being generous, never underestimate that what little you may have, God can do unbelievable things with it. I think we always sit back and think, well, we don't have big money or we can't make a big, you know, we can't make a big show of something. We don't have big talent. We're not, we can't, we're not gonna be holding a microphone. We're not gonna be doing this or that. And you underestimate what God has put in your hand. And if anything we learn here, among other things in, in 1 Kings 17, we learn that whatever you've got, great or small, whatever it is, if God wants it and you'll give it to him, he's gonna do something with it you will not be able to ma imagine. So she gave all she had in that moment. God used what she had in that moment. And then, you know what happens? The third thing that happens here? She received more than she ever had. Because in that moment, she just chose to be generous and trust God. I think becoming generous means five, uh, four things. As I thought through this topic and looking at how God wants to use us and has used us as a church, and again, this is not about money. It includes our money, but it's so much more than money. So I think the first thing that's gotta happen, if we're gonna be a generous person, there's gotta be a change of heart. I think stinginess is a heart problem. See, as Jesus begins to change our hearts and our minds, our motives tend to change, our focus tends to change. We see it happening all the time. Someone fairly new to this idea of following Jesus, they begin to trust him and follow him, and they're shocked at certain things that begin to happen in their life that they would never have believed. And a lot of times it has just to do with a change of heart and mind and focus. Look, look at the verse there, Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, the two questions, what is your treasure? What is it, what do you treasure? We all treasure something. Where is it and what is it? Because you see, I think once there's a change of heart, there becomes great joy in watching God do something that you will be shocked by. You, you just won't believe that this has happened. There's, there's, you know, I, I've watched this church now for 37 years, 33 as pastor, and, and there's so many things that have happened. And I know there must be this sense that we're just like any other church or any other business, and we're gonna do something, we just pull a lever over here and it happens. Oh, no, no. What was going on with our elders back in 2003 is things are going so good, the question was, okay, we don't wanna get comfortable. God, stretch us. Don't let us sit here and get all happy about what's going on. Yeah, we only prayed for 200 people. So you've answered that prayer, and it was simply a stretch me question by our leaders in this church, who now for nearly 60 years, have said we're gonna do the best we can in handling the money the people give, we're gonna stay out of debt, we're gonna use our own skills and abilities and talents and gifts, and we're gonna do what God has called us to do. But I'll, I'll promise you, 
God, I've, I've seen it happen over and over again. You walk away from something and you go, there is no human way that could have happened. And I don't think for a believer there's coincidences. So there's a change of heart. One thing about our counseling and recovery ministries, for example, our care series, people come into our church sometimes with such hard hearts, they've been beat up by life. They've tried everything and, and found out that not much works that we tend to try to heal our souls and the hole in our hearts. And there's this brick wall around our hearts. The Bible calls it hard-heartedness. And we found through these ministries that the heart begins to soften, that God begins to chisel away at the brick wall around our heart. Until there's a change of heart, generosity is not much going to happen, at least for the right reason. So once there's a change of heart, then there's a, a change of attitude. That's the second one. A change of attitude. Suddenly when my heart begins to soften to the things of God, when I begin to be open to what Jesus would want to do in my life, what does it look like if I'm going to follow him? And it's frightening sometimes. And if you've never been really scared to death as a follower of Christ, maybe you need to take a quick look at, are you really following him close enough to, to know when he wants you to do something that just seems a little bit unreasonable? And so when he does that, suddenly your heart is now open to the things of God, and then your attitude begins to change. Look at this verse, Philippians 3, 8. Everything else is worthless compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I count it all as garbage so I could gain Christ. See, that there's an attitude change that takes place after a heart change. When God has your heart, when you've given your life and your, everything about your whole being to God through Jesus Christ, there's a change of heart, and therefore, you begin to change in your attitude about certain things. And, and I think one step in this process of an attitude change is coming to where we, we look at everything around us that we have. I like what I have. I have too much. We all do. I mean, I started my first nine, ten years of my life were in the parsonage back behind the church as the peak of the preacher's kid. I have the counseling bills to prove it, as I always say. But I've always had plenty. And unless God compels us to go sell it all, we don't need to be afraid or ashamed we have something. But he just simply says, and here, here, I think this, what we're hearing clearly in the book of Philippians here is that we've got to somehow enjoy the stuff we tend to have and love and enjoy or hobbies or whatever it is. But we've got to, at the end of the day, realize it's all really worthless. It is truly worthless. And we sometimes get so caught up in treasuring it, and the minute we die, the kids are going to sell it. <laughs> they don't want it. It's worthless. Now, if I can remember that whatever I have is really, it's, it's fun, it's nice, blah, 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 you know, but, but it's not going to own me. It's not going to be my focus. At the end of the day, it's, it's worthless. Everything else is worthless compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, to the point I would count it all garbage. And if there's ever been a time, and there has at different times in, the, in my ministry life, that I felt something needed to go so I could stay more focused on Jesus, I've always taken that step, whatever that may be. But there's going to be a change of heart, then there's a change of attitude. And the attitude changes now you know, I'm finding myself treasuring things that I never even thought about before Jesus got a hold of my life. The third thing that happens if you're going to become a generous person is there has to be a decision. So you've given your heart and life to Jesus. You begin to have a change of attitude about all kinds of things, people and possessions, about your work, about your job, about your gifts. And then you come to a place where, okay, I've got to decide what am I going to do now? What am I going to do as a follower of Christ, as Jesus calls me to do things differently and to see things differently? Well, there's a decision to be made. Paul said to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, it's on your note page, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous, willing to share, 
In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Isn't that interesting, that last phrase? So that we may take hold of the life that is truly life. Last week, we, the text that we were in, it had started earlier in that same chapter, talking about that Jesus would be returning someday. And I know this sounds bizarre to the world. I, I know for those, maybe there's some folks here that have, are new to this whole thing in Christianity, and uh, you, you're an alpha, and you're getting some questions answered. And, and I, I know when I say that there will come a day when Jesus will return and take us to be where he is. That, I know it sounds absurd, but the Bible tells me that when I die, I will, I will be more alive than I've ever been. Amen. So since I believe there's a heaven and a hell, and I believe that Jesus is going to do what he says he's going to do, then why wouldn't I give some thought to what Jesus also has called us to do and lay up some treasure there. I'm always thinking, I'll just, if I can just be prepared for retirement. You know, I just want to be ready so I can retire someday. And I'll just ride this sucker called life. I'm just going to ride it out, you know. Leave the kids, not any money, but a few bills, you know. It's just, <laughs> it was fun. Hope you can pay for it, you know. No, no, I got to start thinking about beyond this one, Be beyond retirement here, because I'm told there's this life. What's, what's this verse say again? First Timothy six. So I can take hold of the life that is truly life. That means let's lay up some treasure. Get it, pay it on forward. Get some treasure where it's going to matter. But that involves a decision. It involves me sitting down alone consistently and asking myself, am I letting anything that I own, own me? Am I letting anything that I have, have me? Am I letting anything that I do become about me? Or am I just willing to be generous with whatever God calls us to be, to do? Change of heart leads to a change of attitude, which leads to a decision, okay, because of Jesus in my life, I'm going to do things differently. I'm going to do what the Bible says I'm supposed to, I'm going to do what Jesus tells me to do. That's what a Christ follower does. If you're going to follow Christ, you do what Jesus said to do. If you don't want to do that, then don't claim to follow him. But this is what people who follow Jesus are called to do and to be. And I told you it's not about money. It includes it, but it's out so much more. And then the fourth thing, if we're going to be really a generous person, then we take action. We begin to make a decision that something needs to change, that I've had some of the priorities out of whack, that it's kind of been about me and me protecting me and serving me and whatever all that comes with that. But now it's time, there's now a decision that I'm going to change, and now we're going to take some action. For example, in Acts chapter 4, when that early church was just starting to form after Pentecost, and they were growing like crazy. And one guy in particular named Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, he sold a field that he owned and brought the money to the apostles' feet so they could use it however there might be a need in the church. Not everybody owns a field, but some people who do own fields, in essence, through the years, have been willing to sell that field, whatever that may be, and God's used it in a pretty significant way. But let me tell you what's happened more so than just those that have been able to sell a field. There's really probably eight to 9,000 people. We don't have fields. I don't have a field. But when the rest of us do our part in serving, I'm talking about just, it's not all money. But if we do our part in using the gift God has given us, if we do our part in being what he's called us to be, if we use the gifts, if, if we are willing to share some things, if we're willing to be available to people and do something that matters to people and lay some of that treasure up for the future, I think that's what makes God smile because we know that he notices. I've told you many times that as a high school student, <clears throat> our family went to... Uh, 
the Holy Lands over in the Middle East to Jerusalem and throughout that whole area of the world. And I remember seeing the Sea of Galilee and you stood on the hillside where Jesus fed 5,000 people and, or 5,000 men. Not, that, didn't, that didn't count women and children. But then you go visit the Dead Sea, which is close by. It's down, down the way. At least it looks close by on the map. You know why the Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea? Because it continually receives, but nothing ever is given out. It's stagnant. That's why they call it Dead Sea. It's dead water. It, it only comes in. Nothing goes out once it gets there. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. And in some ways, it's a unique thing to see. I remember it being somewhat beautiful and unique and of other part eerie and kind of creepy in some ways. Dead. I don't want to be that kind of person. And I think God calls us to be generous with our money. Sure he does. That's pretty clear in scripture. I've told you before, Kim and I were very, very convicted years ago that we'd been two church kids, grown up church kids. We were patting ourselves all over on the back because we were given 10% of our income before tax. Boy, were we proud of ourselves. And then God said, I didn't say you had to stop there. And we haven't. But be generous with whatever we've got. Be generous with your possessions. Be generous with your abilities and the strengths and the gifts that God has given you. Use them for God's purpose and glory. Be generous with those things. You're going to think this is weird. Be generous with your weakness. See, I think another thing good about, that I love about this church that people tell me a lot too, as well as our worship and our generosity in the community, is that this is a church where we're not afraid to admit we're all sinners saved by grace. We've all messed up somewhere down the path. We all have issues we wrestle with. And if we'll be generous in sharing the reality of our life with each other, there's a whole lot of people will feel much more relaxed and comfortable when they walk into these doors saying, these people aren't as weird as I thought they were. They're messed up like I am, but they're not weird like I thought they were. We got to be generous with the lessons we've learned the hard way. That's one thing I love watching happen in the care series or happening in Celebrate Recovery. When somebody else who's been there walks up to somebody and says, hey, I have been right where you are. You have? Be generous with your weaknesses. Be generous with kindness. Be generous with forgiveness. Be generous with patience. A lot of opportunities to be generous. But not much will happen in any church and not much will happen in our individual lives till we understand that whatever it is we have, possessions or otherwise, God wants us to focus on what really matters. His name is Jesus. And when I think of Jesus, I consider everything else, really at the end of the day, garbage. I'm gonna close this in prayer and after I pray, uh, prayer teams will be here at the front and uh, ready to pray with you should you uh, desire to have prayer with someone. And as I say every, every week, it's not about um, this. If it doesn't have to be about anything I've said. It can be about something you walked in with. Let's stand together and I'll close this in prayer. Keep in mind, 2 Corinthians 9, you'll be enriched in every way so you can become generous on every occasion. Loving Father, we are so thankful. Your word is so practical and so powerful and it's so clear we don't come to this text today. We don't come to these verses. We don't come to this topic and leave here with a lack of clarity. Clarity will not be our problem. Action will be our problem. So Father, whatever it is you have for us, maybe there's a person that's crossed our minds. Maybe there's a need in the community. Maybe there's a need in the church. Whatever it is, God, I pray you would find us generous with everything you've put in our hands. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.